I've got up on your blackboard, uh, Angelina College is having difficulty with their blackboard, so y'all weren't able to see the syllabus. I made a copy of it, put it up there as a Word document so you can see it now if you haven't, uh, haven't gotten it yet. There's also a Google form there for you to sign up for your research topics. A lot of you have already done that. That would be wonderful if you just go put it on that form for me. Uh, make my life a little easier. Uh, okay, so last week's lecture, if you missed it for some reason, is up on the YouTube account so you can watch it. This week's, I'm recording it now, and I'll, I'll, I'll link it with the, with the video. So if you, if you missed today, uh, or you just need to refresh your mind or something, you'll be able to watch it in the, you'll probably up tomorrow sometime. All right, so we are talking about the collision of cultures, and we dealt with the red culture um, in, the last, in the last lecture, the American Indian. Today, we're at least going to start the white culture. I will tell you that this is going to be the largest section of any lecture we do all year. It's a big, long section, okay? So it's gonna take us a while to get through it. Uh, the biggest reason is that's the culture that had the most written records, so we, we just have the most information about them, okay? So, again, we're gonna shift a little bit and we're gonna kind of turn into a world history class for a few minutes while we do this. Uh, but we have to figure out how the people got here. So we're going to start off talking about Spain. They're the first that are going to arrive in the Americas. And the Spanish are a unique culture. Uh, they are a mix of Greek, uh, Roman, and later on Muslim and Germanic ideas all together, the barbarians. From Greek, they're going to get their basics of government. Their laws are going to come from the Greeks uh, because they start off as, at least, at least part of Spain, started off as a Greek colony. It's not going to last that way very long. Uh, when the Romans come to power, they're going to dominate it quickly. And the Romans are going to probably have the biggest advantage, the biggest influence of any of these. They're going to give Spain their language. Spanish is a Romance language, uh, just as, as Italian is, as French is. It all comes out of Latin. Uh, they're going to give them the legal code that they're going to use. Even its very name, Hispania, is a Roman name. Uh, What's going to happen to Spain at this point is the Roman Empire, when it collapses, it's going to leave a, a big vacuum there, and the barbarians are going to invade. Now, I don't know if you know what a barbarian is. For our purposes, a barbarian is anyone that is not Roman, okay? It means uncivilized. It doesn't mean my mother thought it meant when she, we were kids and she told us we were all barbarians, although we probably were. It just means not Roman. And the group that invaded into Spain were the Visigoths. These are these Germanic uh, people. And the invasion was, I don't want you to think of the invasion as like large armies coming in, although that did happen uh, a little bit. The invasion was mostly just people looking around going, life's pretty good in Spain, I think I want to go there. And these Germanic people, these Visigoths, came in, and they brought with them their culture. By the way, the term Gothic, you know, a Goth, you know, you think of these people that wear all these dark things. Gothic is a term that was, uh, was invented later on, named after these people, for a style of art and architecture that, that, that Western Europeans didn't like. And the worst thing they could think of to call it was Gothic, because the Goths had come in and destroyed everything. They, they, they got rid of civilization. Up to this point, Spain has followed the same path as the rest of Europe. But Spain is going to make one big difference here. And that's that Spain, unlike the rest of Europe, is going to be invaded by Muslims from North Africa. 
That doesn't happen in France. That doesn't happen you know, in England. Uh, it didn't happen largely in France. The, uh, they were pretty much stopped at the, at the French border. Uh, but these Muslims that had come from the Middle East and gone across North Africa and over centuries had conquered North Africa, in the year 711 of the Common Era, they leaped across the Straits of Gibraltar there and, uh, and, and went from Africa to Spain. That, that map up there is a picture of that. Um, it can be kind of misleading if you've never, never seen that. That spot that separates Africa from Gibraltar, I don't know if y'all can tell that map or not, but there's a, there's a waterway right there between, them, between those two green areas. That, that's the Pillars of Hercules or the Straits of Gibraltar. Guys, it's only 12 miles. That's not very far. When I was a young Marine, I paddled a boat across it uh, on a training out with Spanish. It's not that big of a deal. But in 711, these Muslims crossed there and they didn't leave for 700 years. Uh, when the Muslims came in, instead of instilling feudalism like the rest of Europe did, they're going to put in a form of government that is closer to a caliphate. Uh, they're going to intentionally keep the Spanish from uniting. A policy of divided control. Spain would have a, a series of kingdoms that would each have their own royal prince. I guess I should call them fiefdoms and not kingdoms. But they all had their own prince and they warred against each other. And the Muslims were okay with that as long as they got their share of the taxes. They were actually encouraging this warfare. Uh, as a result of this, there's not going to be a large and significant class of royalty there anywhere. What they are going to do, though, is they're going to adopt the Muslim tradition of being these great traders. And if you look at where they are, it kind of makes sense. They're the link between the Muslim world and the European world. So all of these goods that would come down the Silk Road, they'd come down through Turkey, across the Middle East, they would come across North Africa, and they would meet there at Spain. And then the goods from Europe would come down from England and the, the, the German states and the Scandinavian countries and France, and they would come to Spain and they would trade off of this. <coughs> and Spain became incredibly wealthy off of this trade. The Muslim caliphate became incredibly wealthy off this trade. By the way, the most famous of these caliphates is at a place called Cordoba. Uh, in 92, I got to go see, uh, see Cordoba when I was a, a young, dumb Marine and didn't have any respect for it. But I got to see the, uh, the castle, for lack of a better term, that they, uh, that they had for the caliphate. And it was absolutely incredible to see. Uh, if you go to Spain still today, you can see heavy, heavy influences of the, uh, the Muslim occupation. And they're going to occupy Spain from 711 all the way up until 1492. So a little over 700 years. Okay? Are y'all still ready? Y'all are good? All right. I'm going to move on. If I'm going too fast, y'all just let me know and I'll back up. So, from the conquering of Spain by the Muslims in 711, there's going to be a constant struggle to try and reconquer the Iberian Peninsula. The Iberian Peninsula is that part you see in the picture there is Spain and Portugal. We call this the Reconquista, the reconquering. And it's just this move to expel the Moors, to kick the Muslims out. By the way, that term Moor, I, I, if you're not familiar with it, that's just an African Muslim, okay? It's, a, it's the Muslims from North Africa. The, uh, the kings 
of these, or princes, I guess, of these little principalities, kept the Muslim tradition of, of keeping the spoils of war. You may have heard the statement before, to the victor go the spoils. And not really known what that meant. Well, there was a, uh, a Muslim tradition that's not unlike the idea of a tithe in Christianity. Uh, in a tithe, you gave 10%. But in this Muslim tradition, 20% of whatever you got, particularly taxes, went to the state. Well, in these cases, the kings kind of adopted that idea, and they allowed their warriors to, to declare war and to attack other people, sometimes other Spaniards, other Iberians. Uh, but whatever they took, 20% of that went to the kings and queens. As a result, you're going to have a bunch of these little kingdoms. And each one of these names is a separate kingdom that you see up here. Okay, Oviedo, Marida, Sevilla, all of these places are, uh, are, are Spanish kingdoms. And each one of them were getting wealthy off of raiding the other's goods. The most powerful of these kingdoms was Castile. Uh, Castile was famous for uh, what it, it's called the Castilian hallmarks, survival, valor, and loyalty. These become the characteristics of the conquistadors that are going to come to America, the conquerors. So you can see that there's, this, there's a lot of pride there. These people wouldn't have been calling themselves Spanish at this point. They, they would have been Iberians or Saragossans or Cordovans, okay? Uh, but they're definitely not Moors, and they're, they're not happy with the, with the Moors at all. I'll give you a minute to get this written down before we move on. You write so frantically. We are just about done. All right, I'm going to move on unless I'm going too fast. So how does the Rey Conquista become a crusade? Here's a term that I want you to understand, to know is crusade. A crusade is a, a war in the name of God, okay? A religious war, a holy war. And the Rey Conquista stops being about nationalism and it becomes about war on the Muslims. There are some reasons for it. Uh, in the first place, Spain becomes the most Catholic or the most Christian of the European nations. In the year 900, a tomb was found that was believed to be the tomb of Santiago. Santiago, or St. James in English. They believed that this was the tomb of the brother of Christ. And 
that James himself, when Jesus had died, James had come to Spain and he had bought Christianity to Spain. And this gave Spain a first generation connection to Christianity. And they were very proud of this. Uh, they became, again, the most devout of the Catholics. As a result, the church in Rome became an ally of them. Uh, now, when I say the Roman church, uh, you could say the Catholic church. The reason I don't say that is because at this point there wasn't such thing as a Protestant church. The Catholic church was the Christian church. That was, that was, that was pretty much it. Uh, by the way, that's what Catholic means. It's, it, it's just all-encompassing. It means the, the church. Uh, but the Roman church and the Pope become an ally, and they start funneling goods and soldiers and weapons to the Spanish in order to fight against the Muslims. What is most important, though, is with the development of Christianity as this dominant force in Spain, the kings and queens of Spain started to be recognized as divine right kings by the Pope. Now, that might not sound like a big deal. If you don't know what a divine right king is, it's somebody that was chosen by God to be the ruler. Guys, that is super powerful. If you're a king of a devout Christian nation and you can convince the people that God selected you to be king, who's going to argue with you? You can tell them to do anything. Because to disagree with you would be the same as to disagree with God. Okay? And that's going to give them a lot of power. And they're going to be able to sell this, not as a reconquering of Spain for the Spanish people, but a reconquering of Spain for God. And people are willing to do this. Okay? So the ring and peace day is awesome. By the way, if I sounded like I was a little uh, suspicious of this tomb of St. James, I am very suspicious of it. Uh, when I was in Spain, I went to at least three places where Santiago was buried. Okay? Now, I'm not sure how you bury one person in three different places, but I suspect that there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of fishiness going on. Uh, so you got, you got to wonder about these things. But people believe it. All right. Economically, Spain is going to change from the rest of Europe because of the Reconquista, because of its constant warfare with the Muslims and the constant fear of, uh, of your home burning, of, of your property being destroyed. Instead of being farmers, they became ranchers, uh, mostly sheep, but, but, but cattle as well. And the reason they, they shifted to this is if the Muslim horde came through, if the Muslim armies came through burning things, you could take your sheep and you could take your cattle and you could flee with them and you still had wealth. If you had crops and they burnt them, you were in trouble. You can't pick up your cabbage and flee with it, okay? Uh, so the very ideas that we have, I guess you could pick up your cabbage and flee with it, that'd be awful funny. But the, uh, the very ideas that we have as Western ideas, they're really Spanish ideas. The vaquero, the, the cowboy that, that, that becomes famous in Texas. The vaquero is actually based on a Castilian idea of you know uh, the, the way that they uh, you know, the way that they herded first sheep and later later cattle. The rodeo, the roundup. This is a Spanish idea. Uh, the the fact that the kings had you know had this vast area they needed to govern. And they developed city councils. They called them ayuntamientos. These were just governments that governed in the name of the king. They were the king in the king's absence. Well, why did they have to develop? Well, the king was out leading battles, leading, leading troops. He didn't have time to govern everything. So he left these town councils in charge. That's going to come to, uh, to the United States as something different. It's still very big in Mexico. Uh, if you go down, clo the closer you get to the border in Texas, the more you'll see the importance of, of town councils and governing cities, because that's a tradition in that culture. Uh, 
And while we have town councils everywhere, every city has a town council, the strength of it is uh, it, it changes from place to place. Uh, my family down in South Texas, you go down there, those city councils down there, they run things, period. Uh, and it's part of the tradition they have. The, I even mean, the end of the tradition. All right, well, let's talk about the Catholic Kings. This is Ferdinand and Isabel. Uh, Ferdinand and Isabel were, they were cousins, first off. Sure. Uh, not unusual, but yes, they were cousins, and that makes, uh, take a look at Ferdinand there, he's got that Habsburg chin. Uh, that's, the fact that he looks like a mutant may be the fact that his parents were cousins too. Uh, in 1469, Isabel, the king of Castile, and Ferdinand, the king of Aragon, married. Now you'll notice I'm using the term king, not queen. Uh, I'm doing that intentionally because Isabella was the sole ruler of her kingdom. She ran Castile. It was hers. And in Spanish, y'all, most of you have taken a Spanish class. You know that uh, gender is very important in the Spanish language. Well, she saw queen as a more, as a weaker term than king. She referred to herself as a king, okay? Uh, now, it's going to change whenever, later on when they marry and merge their kingdom, she's going to start being called queen. But they're really both Catholic kings at this time period. Uh, they both get married. Isabel runs Castile. Ferdinand runs Aragon. And for 10 years, they stayed that way. She had her country. He had his country. Everybody was happy. But in 1479, they unite these two kingdoms. And they form the new nation of España, of Spain. Why is it going to be important? <clears throat> well, this is going to be the largest nation in Europe. And they're very quickly going to put down all the other kingdoms in Spain. Everybody but Portugal. Portugal will continue to exist. Uh, and they're going to do it by taking these local militias that had been loyal to individual princes and nationalizing them. And they created the first real powerful national army in Western Europe. At least the first since, since Rome. Uh, this is going to be the really the first superpower post Roman Empire, okay? And Spain's going to dominate everything. <laughs> By the way, if you ever read about these, Isabel seemed to be to be a much more competent ruler than her husband. Ferdinand kind of seems like an idiot sometimes. Uh, Isabel, very very brilliant, uh, was respected by by the world. Anyone still writing? Anyone smart still writing? Just camera. Okay. All right, moving on. Let's get to know this guy, Prince Henry the Navigator. Henry was a, he was royalty, he was a prince, but he wasn't going to be king. He was way down the line. Seven, eight people have to die before he becomes king, okay? And he was a minor prince in Portugal, which at this time was an on-again, off-again Spanish principality. Uh, and he decides to Instead of becoming a, uh, you know, just a lazy monarch in waiting, he decides to throw himself into developing the greatest navigation school in the world. Now, that's his word for it. He called it a navigation school. Today, we probably call it a naval academy, okay? It would be like the equivalent of a naval academy. And he brought the smartest people in the world to his academy. He brought the greatest cartographers, a cartographer is a map maker, the greatest shipbuilders, the greatest sailors. He put them all in this place and he trained the next generation of, of sailors. 
They came up with new inventions, like the tripartite cell. You don't know what the tripartite cell is. Uh, remember when you were in Miss Thistlebottom's class in elementary school, and you had to cut out the Mayflower out, out of construction paper, and you had the ship and the big square cell, and then above it was that triangle cell? That triangular cell at the top is the tripartite cell. It acts as a rudder in the wind, and it allows the ship to, 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 to turn quicker and to even sail against the wind to an extent. You can't go directly 100% into it, but you can, can cut into the wind a little bit. The tripartite sail gives ships direction. Before this, the way that you got somewhere was you had that big old block sail, and you went out and you waited until the wind was blowing the direction you wanted to. You raised the sail and you went as far as you could to the wind ship, and then you took your sail down and waited for the way that. That was not effective. The tripartite sail is going to be super effective. They also developed the Mariner's Compass. Uh, it just says compass up here. The state of Texas just wants you to know compass, but in reality, a compass had been around for hundreds of years. But they didn't work at sea because of the jostling of the ship. You needed some way to, to seal it. Uh, you needed one that on a ship with all the metal of the that's on a ship wasn't going to be screwed up. So a mariner's compass was a it was a compass that, that, that worked at sea. Uh, some people he he perfected the astrolab. He didn't invent it. The astrolab is a tool that they used to, to look at the heavens and determine your your line of latitude on the Earth's surface. Uh, so now he can figure out his latitude. He has a compass telling him what direction. And he has a cell that says that he can go the way he wants to go. Suddenly, because of Prince Henry the Navigator, ships' captains could actually set out for something instead of just raising your sail and hoping you hit something. Okay? It's going to be much more effective. You could not have had the Age of Exploration without Prince Henry. All right, let's get to this guy. 1492, there's a year that you have to know for your test. Uh, you all learned it from Miss Thistlebottom. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? Well, <coughs> you'll see up there I have year of discovery with a question mark after it. There's a reason for that. We have said for years that Christopher Columbus discovered America. I cannot comprehend how somebody can discover a place that 64 million people are already living at. Uh, he didn't so much discover it as he stumbled upon it. So let's kind of look at, 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 at this guy a little bit and, and see what's true about him and, and what's Maybe not so true. Uh, first off, this is probably not a picture that you've ever seen of Columbus. Uh, our problem is we don't really know what Columbus looked like. There are dozens of paintings of Columbus. And if you look at all of them, none of them look like they're the same person. We don't really know what Columbus, if Christopher Columbus was his real name because he just kind of appears on the record from nowhere. We, uh, we know he's not Spanish. He was, he was Italian, at least officially, although some people think he might have been a, uh, a Spanish Jew that had escaped during the diaspora when the Spanish were, were slaughtering Jews uh, and escaped to Italy and then come back with this, with this other name. We don't really know. So what do we know? Let's talk, look at the facts. If you were taught, I hate that bell. If you were taught by Miss Thistlebottom that Columbus was the first person to teach that the earth was round, you were mistaken, okay? Everybody knew the earth was round by this point. They really did. They just didn't comprehend how big the Earth was, okay? Uh, people had known the Earth was round since the ancient Greeks. Heck, in the Old Testament, the Bible says God sits upon the circle of the Earth. That's 
telling you something right there. So it's not a new idea that the Earth was round. What Columbus does is he proves it. And people thought he was crazy. Columbus, in 1492, has this plan. <clears throat> he wants to reach these islands east of India, the East Indies Islands. They're the Spice Islands. And he's in Europe. We've been trading with, with these Indies for years, but they've been trading it by the goods going from the islands to India, getting on the Silk Road, and then crossing Europe, or crossing the Middle East, getting to Europe. And at every stop, they would sell it to somebody else, and the price would go up. And by the time it got to Europe, these spices would be 100 times more expensive than they were if you just could have gotten them directly. So his plan was, if I can get a ship to go to the Indies, I can buy that stuff directly and I can get rich. That was really the plan. The problem is basic geography. He looks at the map and he says, Africa is in the way. I can't get from Europe to India because Africa is here. And a couple of months out of the year, you can't get around the southern tip of Africa. There's, there's ice down there. That's, that's the Antarctic Ocean down there. Okay, So it's not profitable. And there was no Suez Canal that you can go to the Mediterranean and come to Red Sea like you can now. It didn't exist at the time. So he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just sail around the world. I'm going to go west to reach the East Indies. This is a crazy idea. This would be like if I told all of you that we are going to go to New York City. We're all going to New York City. And I came by to pick you up in a bus, and I turned, and you saw me heading due south towards Mexico. You went, we're going the wrong way. No, it's OK. We'll get there eventually. We're just we're going around. OK? It's, it's, it's dumb. It doesn't make sense. And people do that. He tried everywhere. He tried the dojo of Venice, the, the guy that, that, that ran the, the city, Italian city center of Venice. He tried the king of, of England. He tried Philip the Fair, king of France. They all laughed at him. <clears throat> His last chance is Spain. And he shows up, and I can just see this in my mind, where he shows up and he says, I got this idea. We all know where the East Indies are. They're, they're east of here. Well, I'm going to sail west to get there. You know, we know it's to the left, but I'm taking a right. I'll get there eventually. The king laughed at him. The king thought it was ridiculous. So, what do you do? Well, it turns out his wife, Isabel, is much, much, much smarter than he is, okay? And she says, hold up. I'll give you the ships. And I'll pay for the voyage. But if you find a somebody bit me at that bell. If you find a route to Asia, to India, I own the route. And whatever we sell, I get. And two, if you happen to discover anything on the way it's mine. Columbus says, Great, we'll do this. Ferdinand thinks his wife is crazy, but it turns out his wife was thinking much deeper than he was. Because Isabel gave him three ships. The Nina, the Pink, and the Santa Maria, right? They were three of the crappiest ships in the Spanish Navy. They were literally sinking in the harbor. She was scheduled to destroy them. They were... They, the, Columbus had to do a massive amount of work just to keep them floating, okay? Bad one. And then she said, I need a crew. What can I do with the crew? She hires a couple of professional sailors, and the rest, she goes to the prison that she has, and she says, hey, any of you want to volunteer to go on this crazy voyage where you'll probably die? If not, you can stay here and you will definitely die. And the prisoners, in a foreign agreement to get out of prison, agreed to go on this voyage. So now Columbus is about to set off on this voyage 
in three ships that are falling apart and a crew of prisoners. It's not a great, great system, okay? Why do I say Isabel Smart? Think about it. If Columbus discovers anything, she is rich. And if he doesn't, she's out three ships she was going to destroy anyway, and she emptied her prisons. Okay? She's not in trouble, no matter what she does. Brilliant move. If you ever see these ships, they're very tight. You can go to Corpus if there's a, a out, out off Padre Island in Corpus, there's a recreation of the Santa Maria. Uh, and it's it's very small. I mean, it's inside it's 20 feet across. It's tiny, tiny, tiny. Uh, I always think there was a Back in 1992, when we had the 500th anniversary of Columbus, there was a, a commercial, I forgot what it was for, but it had Columbus, and he's making his pitch, and Isabel shakes her head, yes, you can have it. And he gets on this little rowboat, and they're, they're, they're rowing him out to sea, and he throws his arms out, and he says, take me to my ships! And this bandit grabs his leg and goes, sir, this is your ship. <laughs> That's kind of what it's like, okay? It's, it's, it's that small. He, uh, he does set off. <coughs> the problem is, the Earth is considerably larger than he thought it was. Turns out, he thought the Earth was about a third the size of what it actually turned out to be. So, he sets off, and he's almost immediately going, any minute now, we're going to find India. In the meantime, he's sitting in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Okay? Has no idea that there's an American there. They were so close to, to, to mutiny that Columbus was keeping two sets of records. When I was in Barcelona, I got to see the records. Now, I don't read Spanish, so at least not well enough to, to understand. I know just enough Spanish to order at Taco Bell and get my butt kicked in Mexico. Okay? But they, uh, I went to this museum there where they had the two sets, and they read them to us. And one of them says, you know, this is the official, the official books that everybody can read. And it's like, day 35 on the ship. Things are going well. The people, people look great, and we will be approaching land any minute now. And then there was his private books, and it says stuff like, day 36, where the hell am I? Had no idea where he was. Okay, And he knows that the crew is getting ready to mutiny. The crew is actually plotting to throw him overboard and take the ship back. Because they don't think they're ever going to get there. And then all of a sudden they spot land. What they landed on was the Bahamas. They named it San Salvador. What a great name it means Columbus named it, it means my salvation. Why do you think he, 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 he called it my salvation? Because he's not swimming back to Spain, okay? He was saved. Columbus would have died. The men would have killed him. Uh, he does believe that he has discovered the Indies. He calls them the West Indies. He believes he, he is on islands just south of India. I want you to think about how far off he was. If you were to get a globe and you were to put your finger on the Bahamas and then shoot a line straight through the globe to the other side, it would come out at India, okay? You're literally half a world off. He has no idea how big the world is. Uh, it is important Columbus was not even the first European to come to America. Uh, the, the Vikings had been here before. The Chinese were probably here before that in, in, uh, in South America and in, uh, in California. Uh, but he's going to be important because when Columbus shows up, the Europeans never leave. Okay, he's going to establish European the European conquest of the Americas. All right, so. Here's our snapshot day. I told you during the red period that you're going to have a question where at some point where it's compare 
red, white, and black. 1492. This is the slide that you need for that essay question. We're going to use 1492 as our snapshot in all three cultures. Uh, European societies had extremely strict social classes. Whatever class you were born in, you were going to stay in. There were nobles at the top. What's a noble? King, queen, and their family, right? It's the royal family. It's all the mutants that you see, see on, on TV with, with uh, Prince Charles and his mutant children. Have you seen those guys lately? They all have the Habsburg chin. That's all I'm saying. We know what causes the Habsburg chin. All right. So the nobles at the top, not very many of them. Below that are your artisans. An artisan is a skilled worker. It could be a, uh, an armorer, a cooper. A cooper makes barrels. A wheelwright makes wheels. Uh, a leather worker. It's anybody with a special skill. Okay? Below that are the merchants, people that buy and sell good. And then you have the other 80% of the population. They're the crafts, the peasants, the serfs, the valines, as they call it in, in France. Uh, the vast majority of people are peasants tied to the land. Uh, the families were nuclear. That means that they tended to be like what we associate as families a husband, wife, and children. Unlike in the Indians, which we saw the family tended to be extended, where everybody lived with the grandparents, and the grandparents dominated every night. It's going to be different in this culture. Uh, it was patriarchal. If you don't know what patriarchal is, you need to know that word. It just means male-dominated. Uh, patriarch literally means the father in, 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 uh, uh, in Latin. It comes down to us as Papa uh, or the Pope. Almost all power was held by men. There are some notable exceptions. You had Eleanor of Aquitaine that was a dominant French lady. You, of course, had Elizabeth I who was, you know, freaking awesome. We'll talk about her later on. Uh, but mostly it was patriarchal. It was male dominated. Okay? Y'all all got that? Yeah. All right. We're going to have to stop here because this, like, this slide alone is going to take me 30 minutes to do. Uh, so we will pick up here next time. I will try and get uh, the first half of the study guide up there so you can start working on things as you need to. Don't forget to sign up for your research topic. It is first come, first serve. The Google form is on your blackboard. Uh, if the topic is not on there, and you, if you want to do it, just let me know. I will probably say yes, uh, unless it's something really, really weird. Uh, you'll, you'll probably get to do it. Uh, that means you, Cameron. I don't want to hear any of that weird stuff that you're into. Uh,